Welcome, everyone. Thank you very much for joining today's webinar, which is titled Recognizing Impactful and Innovative ECE Research and Practices from Asia Pacific. My name is George Pocholios, and I will be the moderator of today's event. The purpose of today's event is two pronged. Firstly, you will hear an update from our next recent initiatives and activities designed to support the early learning sector across Asia. Also, this event aims at informing you about an exciting international award initiative which aims to recognize the work of early learning researchers, developers, and practitioners of childhood education programs. So without any further ado, allow me to introduce you to today's speakers. On behalf of ARNEC, Dr. Sheldon Schaeffer, he is currently chair of the board of directors of the Asia Pacific Regional Network on Early Childhood. He was formerly chief of UNICEF's Global Education Program in New York and director of UNESCO's Asia Pacific Regional Bureau for Education. He has taught, done research and worked in development programs in Southeast Asia for, for over 50 years. On behalf of the Khalifa International Award for Early Learning, Dr. Nirmala Rao, a chair professor at the Faculty of Education at the University of Hong Kong, and Serena H. C. Young, professor in early childhood development and education. During their presentations, please feel free to use the Q&A function and not the chat function to, set, to send us any questions you may have, and we will try to answer them all at the end. Just to also inform you that this session will be recorded. Dr. Sheldon, the screen is yours. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here today to welcome you to this important webinar and to celebrate a new partnership between ARNEC and the LIFA International Award for Early Learning. I would first like to provide a brief introduction to ARNEC and to what it does, and then describe the context of early learning in the Asia Pacific region, the challenges it faces, and what we can do to address these challenges through research and more informed advocacy towards better policies, systems, and services in the region. Next, please. So who is ARNEC? Well, we are a regional network that was created in uh, 2008, originally with UNICEF, UNESCO, and Plan International support, now expanded to include Save the Children and Child Fund. We have 3,000 individual members, 25 institutional members. Uh, the idea is to build strong partnerships in the Asia Pacific region to advance the agenda on and investment in early childhood development. So the vision of ARNIC is a simple one. All young children in the Asia Pacific region realize optimal well-being and development. And the mission derived from the vision is that ARNEC shares knowledge and advocates for children's rights and holistic and inclusive early childhood development. Next, please. ARNEC's strategic and inter interconnected goals are as follows. There are four of them, uh, and they are the product of several years of, of planning and strategizing among the board of directors and the steering committee and the members of ARNEC itself. One is to promote relevant and growing knowledge base on early childhood development, reflecting regional priorities. A second is targeted and evidence-based advocacy for holistic and inclusive early childhood development, integrated multi-sectoral holistic outcomes for children, inclusive ECD systems and programs. That is the goal. Third is to develop strategic partnerships for priority early childhood development actions at the regional level. We'll hear more about that 
in a moment. And finally, strengthening the capacity and reach of ARNIC itself as a network, not only regionally linked into other regional networks, linked into the international global network of the Early Childhood Development Action Network, and where possible linked downward into national networks for early childhood. Next, please. So what are the mechanisms that ARNIC uses to do this work? Well, ARNIC shares ECD tools and resources to influence evidence-based ECD policies program at the country level. If you go to the website, you'll see a variety of guidelines, guidance tools, resources, research results, and other things that are trying to influence, influence policies, evidence-based policies. ARNIC also generates good ECD practices and innovations. It tries to identify them, disseminate them, and it fosters cross-country sharing and learning in the region and beyond on ECD issues. And it does this in many different ways. There are learning groups and communities of practice that focus on one particular issue. There are ECD events, notably what used to be annual ECD regional conferences interrupt by COVID to begin again later this year and other high level policy forums. There is collaboration with ac academia and universities and foundations of various kinds. We've just completed a scoping study on the impact of climate change on young children with Wollongong University in Australia, one example of this kind of collaboration. Also collaborating, as I mentioned, with other networks around the world, ECD advocacy products and platforms, and finally, noteworthy ECD practices. More on that later. And the, the targets of all of this effort, of these mechanisms, are, of course, policymakers, practitioners, networks, donors, institutions, and individuals. Next, please. So ARNIC is committed to evidence-based knowledge sharing and advocacy. And you see here two of our products. One is the connections, which basically tries to lay out good practices that ARNIC has identified. The other is one sample of the kind of guidance or workbook that we put out to look at various kinds of, of practical problems faced by early childhood development. ARNIC is determined to co-develop knowledge with partners to help us advocate for better ECD policies, systems, and investment. We do this by learning from each other what works well, by documenting noteworthy practices of partners and creating with them new knowledge through resource paths, packs, and program guides, and by implementing voices of partners through our ARNIC connections where ECD practitioners write and share their experiences and insights. Next, please. I'll just briefly in the rest of this presentation mention a few things about ECD and the sustainable development goals, challenges, issue of learning poverty and the learning crisis, uh, impact of COVID-19, environmental degradation and climate change, resulting often in increased inequity and exclusion, and finally, the need for research and evidence to inform advocacy for better policies and systems. Next, please. So ECD is globally recognized in the sustainable development goals. It was not easy to have a specific target focusing on this subsector, this level of education. A lot of discussion around it. Should there even be one? What should it read? What should it look like? Finally, it states that by 2030, ensure that all girls and boys have access to quality early childhood development, care, and pre-primary education so that they are ready for primary education. Of course, there are other reasons to have quality early childhood development care and pre-primary education beyond readiness for primary education, but that is considered one of the most important functions and purposes. Next, please. There are many traditional challenges in the region, not only in Asia Pacific, but I think in all regions of the world. In this region, only two thirds of children between 36 to 59 months are developmentally on track. One third are still behind what would be considered to be a regular normal 
development along development stages. Another challenge, participation in organized learning varies across countries in the region due to disparities. There are disparities within countries and across countries, especially related to location, urban, rural, wealth, rich and poor, but also ability and disability, ethnicity, language, and many other things, but great variety across the region. Third, out of the 50 Asia Pacific countries, only 20 provide constitutionally or by legislation policy free, free pre-primary education. An even smaller number are focusing on compulsory pre-primary education. There is, of course, a lack of stimulating learning environments at home for young children, the lack of books, the lack of other reading materials, the lack of parents able to provide stimulating environments themselves because of COVID. Also, the lack in many places of the IT um, equipment that would have been necessary to continue to receive some kind of uh, instruction. And finally, children in high income countries are far more likely to be enrolled in pre-primary education than those in low income countries. The percentages are radically different. Next, please. But in addition to these already difficult traditional crises, there are newer ones which compel even greater individual and systemic adaptation and resilience. It's the growing disparities, the ever widening gaps in provision, access and quality. That is a new crisis. It is COVID-19, which has made the already vulnerable, the poor, those living in rural areas, those with disabilities, those not speaking the language of the, of the school, already vulnerable before the pandemic, more vulnerable after. It's also climate change, increasingly frequent and intense climate events, which immediately or ultimately have an impact on young children. It's estimated, for example, that children born, say this year in another 30, 40 years, by the time they're the age of many of you, many of them will have experienced two to seven times more climate related natural disasters than we have in our generation drought and floods and fires and rising sea levels. This all requires, compels greater adaptation and resilience. And finally, environmental degradation, whether it be toxic soil or water or air, all of this endangering child health and development. Next, please. But underneath all of this is the learning crisis, which is worsening as a result of these crises that I've mentioned above. Put together, these are now leading to serious increased development and learning loss, especially for young children. Note, I'm talking not only about learning loss, which is usually when one talks about learning poverty, primary education is the focus. I'm talking also about increased development loss of very young children who are not able to maintain the path that they are meant to maintain. Next, please. So the result is greater learning poverty, defined now recently as the share of 10-year-old children who cannot read and understand a simple story. Essentially, in most countries, fourth grade, children in the fourth grade or 10 years and not in school, cannot read and understand a simple story. But another result is inadequate social and emotional development. Children, young children, isolated at home, away from their peers and their teachers in early childhood programs, often in toxic stress environments in their own families. And ultimately, all of this leading to greater social and economic inequity and exclusion. Next, please. So according to UNICEF, and there's increasing data about this, Learning poverty, as I said, being unable to read and understand a simple text by the age of 10 has worsened and is estimated to be, estimated to be close to 70% in Asia. If one looks at figures recently from UNICEF, you know, you have a learning crisis already before the pandemic. The learning poverty rates globally of maybe 50% in South Asia, 60%, Middle East and North Africa, 60%. And as a result of the pandemic, 
the learning loss, the learning poverty rate has gone up in many cases 20 or even 30 percent. We have 1.1 trillion hours of in-person learning was lost in the Asia Pacific region because of school closures, education inequality deepened, and young children, of course, were worst affected as they missed not only opportunities for learning, but critical development opportunities. Next, please. The learning poverty among young children, again, exacerbated by COVID-19, climate change, and the environment, calls for studies to help inform and transform ECCE at the policy, systems, and service delivery levels. And that's what this process that we're going to be talking about today is all about. I just want to talk first about good practices that we have found in the region that Arnick has looked at. And many of these were featured at the World Conference on Early Childhood Care and Education organized by UNESCO and other partners in Tashkent uh, late last year. Um, first, in the category of inequitable and inclusive quality ECC services for all, we're looking at, for example, the China REACH program organized by the China Development Research Foundation. Targets children left behind, usually by migrating parents, and cared usually for by their grandparents. One third of children in China might be in this kind of situation. Inputs of the program, nutrition, home visiting, parenting intervention, to somehow increase the knowledge of caregivers of early childhood development. It's gone from a pilot program, initial evaluation, and considerable scaling up with the final goal, goal of policy adaptation. There's also the early child champions and the early and the child development aid programs done by Ammi Child Development, an NGO in India which adjusted programs during COVID-19 to a blended model of both online and in-person components, promoting early care and development, especially for children at risk of poor developmental outcomes based on signs of delays and disabilities. Thus, identification recognition first, assessment, and then where needed and possible referral for more special aid. In the category of good practice of early childhood care and education personnel, the next please. We're looking at combining training with job security to improve the quality of the child care workforce, the ECCD Council of the Philippines. Here there are nationally supported child care training programs offered by the government and also non-government organizations focused in this case on children aged zero to four. The ECCT Council developed guidelines for local government units on hiring, compensation, dismissal procedures for workers. The same local government units introduced local ordinances to improve working conditions and job security. And noteworthy then finally were partnerships developed, which are not usual, between the ECCD Council representing national government local government units and non-government organizations. Next, please. Innovations for advancing transformation. Well, here we have one example, the BRAC Play Labs from the BRAC Institute of Education Development in Bangladesh. This established humanitarian play lab models for zero to six year olds in Rohingya camps. Young women play leaders act as facilitators a play-based curriculum to promote holistic development and social emotional skills. Introduced also to government schools for children aged four to seven, provided also through remote learning programs delivered by apps downloaded into phones, a real innovation. Play-based learning plus positive parenting plus self-care practices of caregivers attempting genuinely to transform how early childhood care and education is being delivered in Bangladesh. Next, please. Finally, in terms of policy, governance, and finance, two examples. Cambodia, well known for its multi-sectoral approach to early childhood development, going back 13 years to the national policy on ECCD, which promoted a multi-sectoral approach to ECD, coordinated strategies across ministries, 
a legal framework, coordinated M&E systems, a national committee for ECCD led by the Ministry of Education, Youth and Sports, but with members from virtually every other relevant ministry and supported by a well-resourced secretariat. And finally, in Uzbekistan, the site of the World Conference I mentioned previously, prior prioritization of early childhood care and education. One of the few countries in the world where there is a established ministry of preschool education. Over 60% of Uzbek children receive a year of early learning education before grade one. Through the efforts of this new ministry, that number will rise. This includes investments in teacher professional development, play-based curriculum and monitoring of standards, and ultimately improved workforce, working conditions and remuneration. Next, please. So research and knowledge are essential to drive ECCE transformation in the region. We've seen the challenges, we've seen the good practices, the challenges have to be examined and understood. The good practices have to be evaluated and assessed. For all of this, we need to have a culture for knowledge creation through research, preferably in partnership, and then a need for data and evidence-based evidence policies and programs. Next, please. It is in this context that we are partnering with the Khalifa International Award for Early Learning to encourage partners to share evidence-based studies focusing on the most impactful approaches and programs for early learning. Arnek is very happy to be part of this partnership. Now I'd like to call on Dr. Nirmala Rao to discuss more about the award for early learning. She's been introduced earlier on. I just want to add that she is a developmental and educational psychologist by training. Her research has focused on the development of psychometrically robust and culturally sensitive measures of both early child development and the quality of early childhood education, early education policy in the Asia Pacific, the evaluation of early childhood programs and culture policy and pedagogy in the early years. As a longtime friend of Arnek, Nirmala, please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Sheldon. Uh, it is really my great honor to be at this webinar uh, um, supporting the Khalifa Award, as well as uh, someone with a very long history of association with Arnek. Um, Sheldon spoke about the need for knowledge and research to transform early childhood care and education in the Asia Pacific region. I, that's a perfect segue into my talk because, and uh, to introduce the award. So I'm going to share my screen. So you need to give me one minute and I think you should be able to see it now. Is that right? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, there's a, a very nice fit between what Sheldon has said and what I'm going to say and the whole thing about uh, our award. We want to recognize the wonderful practices that are going on in early childhood uh, worldwide. Um, but I, I want to start out by just saying Sheldon has uh, provided some data. The data that I'm going to present are sometimes pre-COVID data. So um, we know that uh, children have experienced learning losses, families have experienced uh, financial difficulties, that enrollments may have decreased and fewer children may be developmentally on track because of uh, the COVID pandemic. So please remember this when, uh, when you see the data that I'm presenting. Okay, so the good news is that participation in pre-primary education has increased worldwide. Um, the, the line in yellow shows the gross enrollment ratio in pre-primary education. And this refers to the two years uh, before the start of uh, standard one or primary one. And in most countries, this is three to five years, okay? The line in purple 
uh, shows the adjusted net enrollment rate one year before the official entry to primary school. So this is how many children have had one year of preschool, one year of organized learning before they start primary school, right? So you can see that uh, the enrollment rate, uh, enrollment rate in pre-primary education has increased and uh, it has moved to about 60%. Actually, it's really much higher in high income countries and much, much lower in low income countries. And I'm going to show you those disparities, right? The line in purple is the adjusted net enrollment rate, uh, rate which is uh, used as an indicator to track our progress towards sustainable development goal target 4.2 that uh, Sheldon uh, just mentioned. So let's look at gross enrollment uh, ratios across the region, comparing uh, 2010 and 2020. So if you look at the third column from the left, you can see the high income countries, right, Europe and North America, and you can see enrollment rates there are already now about 86%. But let's turn to Asia. Central and South, South Southern Asia has really increased in enrollment rates. These are national enrollment rates, and as has Eastern and Southeastern Asia. We must remember that in our region, we have two very large countries and changes in their enrollment rates actually change the figures quite a lot, okay? Uh, so in Eastern and Southern Asia, uh, with the increase in enrollment in China, there's a, a big increase in the region, uh, regional rate, in the sub-regional rate. And the same thing is the case in uh, Central and Southern Asia. When India increases the rate of enrollment, it really reflects on the figure. So what we know is that there's increased enrollment. At the same time, we need to ensure that increases in access to pre-primary education are not associated with decreases in the quality of services and increases in inequity. So what do I mean by this? Well, sometimes what happens is when more and more children start attending pre-primary school, the, there tend to be more children in a class, meaning we have less favorable teacher-child ratios and teachers can give less attention to each individual child. So it's really important that as we increase access to schools, we increase the number of trained preschool teachers, we increase the number of facilities, we increase the number of resources. Otherwise, instead of having 20 children with one teacher, we may have 50 children with one teacher and we want to ensure that we have high quality. Also, we want to make sure that increases in access are not associated with increases in inequity. So what do I mean? Well, we know that in Asia Pacific region, we have lots of urban rural disparities in family wealth, in access to to preschool. So what happens is sometimes when countries start promoting access and letting the free market um, uh, take uh, hold, we find more and more children in urban areas are attending preschool and the rural remote children in rural and remote areas don't have as much access to preschool. So what happens is inequity increases. So we need to make sure that inequity does not increase. So what I'm showing here are some data from the demographic and health surveys, which are nationally representative surveys uh, in some countries in our region. Now, these data uh, are as old as 2014 and they go up to 2019, okay? And what they show are inequities in attendance in pre-primary education based on family wealth. So if I can ask you to look at the top 
line where we have Cambodian data from 2014. Um, Cambodia has made lots and lots of progress since that time. And as Sheldon mentioned, they're focusing on governance and finance as well, right? But if you see these data, only 60% of children from the lowest wealth quintile were attending preschool, whereas about 90% of children from the richest quintile of families, the richest families were attending preschool. So what this means is there's a lot of disparity in attendance based on family wealth. If you can go down many, many rows and look at Thailand, and these data are from 2019, what you see is there's a lot less discrepancy in attendance in uh, ECE programs one year before primary school based on family wealth. So why does that occur? Why do we see less disparity in some countries and more disparity in other countries? Well, Sheldon referred to these reasons in his talk. And that relates to the provision of mandatory and free early childhood education in different countries. UNESCO recently did a study uh, of 193 member nations, and they found that 63 countries provided free pre-primary education, 51 countries had made pre-primary educational mandatory, and only 46 out of 193 countries provide free and mandatory pre-primary education. So when countries provide free and mandatory primary pre-primary education and Sheldon provided the data from the Asia Pacific region what we find is there's less inequity that means you don't find discrepancies in attendance based on family wealth or wealth quintiles so what we can see is that governments have a critical role through policy governance and finance in ensuring equitable access to early childhood care and education. So these are what we call top-down approaches and they're very important. At the same time, bottom-up approaches are very important. And the Halifa International Award for Early Learning wants to recognize these bottom-up practices, as well as practices that are in sync with government policy to decrease inequity and improve the quality of early childhood care and education across the world. Uh, Sheldon uh, alluded to the UNESCO conference that was held in Tashkent in November uh, 2022, and he already provided examples of noteworthy practices from across Asia Pacific. He provided examples of practices from Cambodia, from China, from Uzbekistan, right, from the Philippines. The Khalifa Award, International Award for Early Learning, wishes to recognize these sorts of good practices and thereby increase the status of early childhood care and education throughout the world. So let me talk a little bit about uh, the Khalifa Award. This award was initiated by His Highness Sheikh uh, Manzoor bin Zahid Al Nayan, who's a deputy prime minister and chairman of the board of trustees of the Khalifa Award for Education. The Khalifa Award of Education is a sub award, uh, sorry, the Khalifa International Award for Early Learning is a subcategory of the Khalifa educational award. What I would like to do in the next few minutes is talk a little bit about the objectives of of the award, the award categories, the criteria for assessment, provide some application in information and provide answers to some frequently asked questions. 
Uh, the Khalifa Award for International Learning comes under the Khalifa Award for Education, as I've mentioned, and the award wants to promote research and development, excellence and innovation in early childhood education in the Arab world and world, worldwide. As mentioned by Sheldon, it aims to recognize and appreciate distinguished research and teaching practices, wants to raise awareness and promote the publication of outstanding studies to support policy and practice in early childhood education. The award has six major objectives, okay? So it wants to reward and enrich early learning programs that inform practice. So really, we know that there's a lot of good practice out there, just like Arnak has been doing in documenting these noteworthy practices with evidence, right? So we want to to um, recognize these good practices. We want to motivate innovative teachers who develop the best practices in the field of early learning. We know that there's some wonderful, wonderful teachers who use bottom-up approaches and we want to spread these good practices, right? We, we learn from teachers who work in low resource environments on how they can bring learning about and we want to spread these ideas. We want to promote the role of institutions that specialize in the field of preschool and early childhood education. So some organizations run excellent teacher training programs, what we call continuous professional um, development short programs. We want to recognize these programs. But for everything, we need evidence to show that these programs, be they large scale or small scale, work. We want to benefit from the best research and pro programs to support educational policy and early learning teaching practices uh, in the UAE. So learn from what's happening in the Asia Pacific region. We want to recognize programs that promote parental involvement. We all know that parents are the first teachers. And in the region, we really focus on working in collaboration with parents. But sometimes it's not so easy to, to get parents to participate. And we want to reward programs that are successful in doing so and documenting their success. We want to uh, recognize programs uh, that or that promote the all-round holistic development of children. There are two categories for the award. There are the best research and studies uh, a, a category and the best programs, curricula, teaching methodologies and practices award category. So each category has two awards. So there are a total of four awards to be given. So the, for the criteria for best research and studies, we have four criteria. One relates to importance. We really want to know how important is your research? Is it going to make a difference to the lives of children? How innovative it is? Is it original? Is it methodologically rigorous? Does it use appropriate, clearly defined and ethical methods? Has it got impact and has it got the potential to impact areas other than where the re research was conducted? The other award category is the one for best programs, curricula, teaching methodologies and practices. So again, we're concerned with the imp importance, how important is the program? We're concerned with the innovativeness. We want to know how innovative and original are the programs or the research. We want to know the impact of the program. Has it made a difference to child development? Has it made a difference to teacher self-efficacy? Has it made a difference to promoting parental involvement? We need to know the impact of the program. And finally, we're interested in the feasibility and sustainability of the program. What will happen the next year when the program is 
not um, funded anymore. Uh, are there plans to make it, are there plans to scale it up to other areas? We look at all these criteria. We really encourage you to apply to the program. Application information is, a, uh, is available at the website and you have to apply online. And we will have links to the website. So there are many, many questions that, that are asked, right? Uh, what is the deadline for applications? Not very far. It's the 28th of February. The application is about 10 pages maximum, so it won't take you long to do it. There are a total of four awards, two in each category. Each award is 50,000 US dollars. So the Khalifa International Award for Learning totals to 200,000 US dollars. The winners are going to be announced in June 23. As I said, applications should be submitted through the online application system. You have I've given the website down below and we really look forward to receiving. Thank you, Dr. Nirmala. I think there must be something wrong with your uh, audio. Um, can somebody indicate that I can be heard? Yes, we can hear you, George. Thank you, thank you, uh, Evelyn. I would like to thank both uh, Dr. Sheldon and Dr. Nirmala for their very useful uh, insights uh, and presentations today. We already have uh, a few questions and uh, one relates to the award, so I think I'm going to ask Dr. Rao to answer this. Uh, Dr. Rao, can you hear me now? Yes, yes, okay. I can. Okay, uh, the question goes as follows. How many submissions have you received so far for the Khalifa Awards? And what percentage of them come from the Asia Pacific region? Uh, we have received many, many awards and, uh, sorry, many, many applications. The number of course is increasing and it will increase uh, closer to the deadline. But uh, informally, I think that we've had about 90 applications and about 60% are actually from our region, from the Asia Pacific region. So we've had uh, considerable interest and many people have registered, but they've not yet submitted their applications. So I'm confident that we'll have many, many applications and many from this region. When you say many, many people have registered, you mean that you have a lot of registrations, but 90 yes. applications. So many yes. more are in the process of uploading. Absolutely, the... absolutely, absolutely. Thank you, Dr. Rao. The next one goes to Dr. Sheldon. Uh, it's quite an insightful question, I may, I may add. Given the current status of ECE enrollments, how realistic do you think the SDG goal to ensure that by 2030, all girls and boys have access to quality early childhood development care and preliminary education is? Well, I might, I might not be popular by saying this, but I don't think it's very realistic. Uh, I don't think it was very realistic when it was drafted. Um, there's this whole question about how you fit, how you write goals. I mean, going back to the Zhong Tian Declaration of 1990, I was on the drafting committee of the declaration and the question was how, how aspirational do you make goals? 100% universal to try to push and nudge countries? Or how realistic do you make them so that most countries think they can actually achieve them as opposed to realize, realizing early on that they won't? So I think it's, it's, it's not too realistic that that goal will be achieved, even less so now because of the impact immediately of COVID-19, where enrollments have gone down, and inequities have increased. So uh, I think we still have to focus on the goal, on the target. I think we still have to promote it. I think we still have to use it as a benchmark that governments can measure themselves against and that we can look at and compare countries across. Uh, but I think 
it's likely that it's very likely the target will not be achieved and therefore the time will come how do we rewrite it how do we redraft it how do we reprogram for having a better chance of achieving it next time thank you dr shelter we've got a lot of questions coming in so another one for dr Rao. who will be reading the applications i guess what the uh, but the, uh, um, our guest means is who is going to be adjudicating the, the, the application. Right, right. There is an award committee which consists of five people. Um, uh, the, the names of the people uh, are on the website. Uh, they're all, um, I'm one of the uh, adjudicators. There's a jury of five people, uh, very distinguished scholars from different parts of the world. Uh, and they will, um, uh, that's the the jury the jury is fine so the information is available on the website i uh, there from um Rutgers university oxford um uh two people from uae internationally yeah. acclaimed uh, professors from the field i i assume yes yes another one what are some of the i think that goes for the, dr sheldon what are some of the enabling factors that support the government to provide free preschool education? Any good practices observed that can be replicated or learning for another for other countries? Why, why do I get all the difficult questions? So, <laughs> let me try to answer that. Um, I think you know part of it is demand. You have to have coming up from the ground pressing against the government and even local governments for um, free preschool education. And that means that parents, communities, families have to understand it's important. So they actually request it and push for it. Um, on the other hand, of course, is supply. And there are international benchmarks for what percentage of education budgets should go to preschool education, what percentages of GDP per capita should go, et cetera. And, and some countries, again, are getting to the point where they are getting close to, or in some cases have even exceeded certain standards. Uh, the best, the good example I mentioned is in Uzbekistan, where you have actually a good practice where there is a dedicated ministry of pre-primary education not a department of or a director general of preschool education in another ministry, but it's actually its own ministry with its own functions, its own budget. And I think that's probably one of the important enabling factors. So, you know, advocacy, pushing from the bottom, providing funding from the top, top make sure that ministries of finance are actually involved in some of the discourse around the importance of early childhood. So it doesn't only become uh, those who already believe in early childhood talking to each other, but those skeptics perhaps convinced that it's important. I think that also is important. Thank you, Dr. Sheldon. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind who should answer the next uh, question because it's, it's, it's from uh, our friend Farida who starts the question by saying, Dear Nirmala, I am planning to submit a study that is related to my PhD research area but not using the same data, would that be okay? Oh, that's a very hard question to answer. We do not want to actually see PhD studies or master studies um, because of the purpose of uh, this award. Uh, last time we had people submitting uh, their PhD thesis. However, if uh, the study has evidence and it's not the data from the PhD study, um, you know, perhaps you studied something that was uh, promoting parent involvement or something that can was scaled up outside the PhD, um, or it was a new curriculum that so it has to be outside the PhD and there needs to be some evidence. I always say, uh, if in doubt, apply. <laughs> Um, you know, but uh, the awarding the selection committee has been very clear in their guidance about not having um, studies that are based on students' PhDs or uh, master's thank thesis. You. Thank you, Dr. Rao. There's another one for you. Can non-profits working in India also apply for this award? Are there any regional boundaries, boundaries no. for this award? 
Yes, we encourage applications from all over the world. This is an international award. Anybody can apply. There's no application fee. Uh, anybody can apply um, for the award. We encourage, um, you know, awards from different regions and parts of the world. The only thing is, I think this time the bar will be uh, quite high because um, uh, we, our criteria are very, um, uh, I have been set down and, you know, the work has to be rigorous. It needs to be evaluated. There needs to be evidence that the practice has worked the practice has been disseminated. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I, ca I can provide the answer to the next couple of questions who, from Fatima and Lurilen asking if they can receive a copy of this uh, webinar. And the answer is yes, it's been recorded and we are going to send it to uh, everybody who uh, attends and requests a copy. Another question. Uh, from anonymous attendee, are parents encouraged to share the educational practices they came up with and implemented with their kids during COVID-19? That's an interesting question, I think. I think it's wonderful what parents did during COVID, during when during school, school suspension. Um, but I don't think that these are the kind of um, uh, questions that the award, the, the kind of practices that the award would recognize very, um, would be appropriate. I'll tell you why, unless it's, if there's a program that was developed by parents that was scaled up to many, many parents and was rigorously evaluated, then that would be appropriate. But if it's just something done with one parent who's mentioned it to a couple of friends who've tried it and the data the evidence is anecdotal then i don't think um it would be something that uh is is what the awardees uh the award uh, committee is looking at but parents are most most important the the issue is it's not a question of whether practices with pairs shared with parents are important the issue is whether the program has been evaluated and has rigorous uh, rigorously evaluated and evidence can be provided about the efficacy of the program and the scale up of the program. Another related question to that one, uh, Dr. Rao from Mukesh, he says, he asks, can I apply in individual capacity or I need to apply through an NGO only? You can apply it at individual capacity. We have both individual and team applications. So definitely you can apply in an individual capacity. Okay. Could I just add something to the, I just want to add something to the previous question. Quite apart as for an application to the award, the issue of, of parents coming up with innovations and sharing them, I think has happened to some extent. You can see examples where individual schools or early childhood development centers have worked themselves to develop with parents innovative ways of doing hybrid learning, for example. Um, you hear more and more examples of how you have, you know, WhatsApp or Line or other kind of mechanisms as a way to keep parents involved with each other and with the facilitators getting lesson plans and other things. So I think um, there is not systematic collection, at least globally, of these kind of parental or local innovations, but I think they're important. When one talks at all about the, if you will, opportunities presented by COVID, it's the innovations in parenting and teaching learning uh, under, at times of crisis, which I think is one of the important opportunities we have to look at. Absolutely, absolutely. But I think the point that I was making, you know, the lot of ways of promoting learning at home, that for the application, there needs to be evidence of the eff effectiveness. Yeah. Uh, thank, thank you both. Uh, we still have six minutes and a few more questions to run through. Um, one from Rosaline. I am presenting, Brit probably she means I am representing British Publishing House ESL. We have new material movie represented and summary for a book 
free primary? Can I apply? It's very hard for me to um, actually answer individual questions because I, I don't know, uh, you know, the details. But uh, all I can say is, if in doubt, apply. We are going to apply the criteria that I mentioned in the presentation, right? So it's not enough to develop something. It needs to be piloted or evaluated and we need to see evidence that it's been scaled up and that it's effective. Uh, there's another yeah. one for you, Dr. Rao. Can, can a longitudinal study completed in 2017 and which had had implications on policies and programs in the following years, would that be eligible for submission? As I said, it's it's hard to mm. respond about individual questions. It should be, it depends on the evidence that would come under a research study, what evidence you can provide of the effectiveness, et cetera. So uh, it, it would be better to have more general questions. I know people right. have specific questions, but it's, right. you know. <laughs> Another question from, from Ha. Uh, yes, the answer is everybody from everywhere in the world can submit. Uh, their uh, submission for the award. And I've got one more, a little bit specific, but I think this a little bit more open at the same time. Uh, one of our friends asks you, Dr. Rao, submitting entries in English language could be a barrier for quality research and programs from around the world where English is not widely spoken. Do you plan to allow entries written in different languages in the future? Uh, I don't know about that. Uh, I know for this round that all applications have to be in English. Uh, unfortunately, or well, the, the situation is the, uh, the judging committee may not all have access, may not be able to understand all languages. And in terms of fairness, at least this round, everything is in English. Um, okay, okay. I understand. Uh, I think uh, I'm not getting another oh, another one. How long ago that study should have been completed, Dr. Rao? How long ago <laughs> that study should have been completed? It must uh, be a fairly I, recent study, I suppose, right? Um, OK, that's a hard question to answer because sometimes when you do research studies, they take some time to have impact. Okay, because if you want to measure impact. So assume you did something four or five years ago, it may take time for the impact to be shown. Impact may not be immediate. So for example, when we do advocacy work, we don't see the impact immediately, right? We, it takes some time. So it, it I, I would just, say maybe you know within the past 10 years I'm <laughs> that's not a criteria I've not con uh, communicated with my other fellow uh, committee members but I would assume that it would have has to be fairly recent yeah Paul. okay uh, I think uh, we only have uh, a couple of more minutes left uh, no more questions have come through so uh, in that note Okay, we've got another very specific one. Uh, we'll try to answer it uh, offline. Dr. Sheldon, thank you uh, very much indeed for your time and contribution to today's event. And also you, Dr. Rao, for your uh, insightful presentation and the details you gave us for the Khalifa International Award for Early Learning. I would like to thank all 75 participants who joined us in today's meeting. We hope you found it uh, insightful, useful, and we look forward to uh, um, receiving your uh, awards, your submissions for the awards. Thank you very much indeed, everybody. Have a nice rest of the evening. Thank you. Thank you.